Like the soil of our land and the air that we breathe, water is so commonplace that we often take it for granted. For instance, did you know that some 16 million tons of water fall on the earth every day? In North America, from this vast amount, the average person requires 200 gallons of water every 24 hours. Nature is even more demanding. An acre of grass will lift up more than six tons of water on a June day. 565 tons of water are required to produce one ton of wheat. Just what is water? What is this God-given heritage which nations have wasted and polluted? To a parched plant or a thirsty man, water is life itself. Water may be a place in which to fish, to cast a fly and boat, or swim, or sail a boat. To a trapper in the North Country, water is a snow-covered hill or a frozen pond or a cool white blanket on which to beat a trail or drive a team of dogs. Water is even more than that. It is the very lifeblood of the earth. Without water, there would be no lakes, rivers, or prairie sloughs. There would be no duck hunting, no waterfowl, no duck hunters. Life on Earth would be unbearable, impossible. The wildflowers which pour out their beauty and fragrance on this Earth must have water, lest they wither and die. All wildlife depends on water. All must have water or perish. The young of the wood thrush get moisture from the food they eat. Shorebirds must have water, like the long-billed curlew, sometimes called the flying oil can. Water insects form part of the diet of the yellow rail, who haunts the borders of marshes. Franklin gulls band together in great flocks on prairie sloughs. Even the grebe or hell diver covers its nest with wet vegetation. The sandhill crane feeds on frogs, and frogs must have water. Of course, no bird takes to the water like the duck himself. Canada Goose. Or the Whistling Swan. Without water, all of Earth's creatures, big and small, would quickly vanish. The Weasel. The Badger. Even the flicker-tailed gopher who gets his moisture from the grass he eats. Deer browse on greenery, which requires much water. Moose live on the succulent roots of the water lily, escaping insect hordes by frequently submerging in lakes where they feed. Yes, water is their life, too. There was a time, many years ago, when nature ruled the earth in her own way, without man's interference. She carpeted the ground with trees and grass and hid her treasures in deep, dark canyons. 
Her rivers ran cold and clear, and her streams harbored fighting fish. Waterfowl millions blackened the sky. Then came man, plundering his way westward, building great cities, destroying his rich heritage. Clear the land, the cry went out. They cleared the land. Trees fell, and bulldozers tore at the roots. And flames licked the soil with hot tongues. Far and wide, the cry echoed, Clear the land! Clear the land! The plow had left its scars upon the prairie floor, and the grain grew green and tall, and ripe kernels were milled into flour to feed an ever-hungry nation. Slowly, the sloughs and grasses began to vanish, replaced by waving fields of grain. There was grain as far as the eye could see. In Canada's prairie provinces, agriculture steadily encroached upon the duck breeding range. Men needed more land to plant with golden grain, to create more wealth, to feed more hungry people. They dug ditches and took water from the potholes and ponds and planted seed in the lake bottoms. Yes, some of the new land produced amazing crops, but much of the old marsh country was unsuited for farming, unfit for anything but raising ducks. As the wooded slope was destroyed and the land drained, water tables began to drop. Potholes disappeared, marshes almost vanished. Slowly, crops began to fail, and these were familiar sights on the prairies deserted farms, abandoned homes. Man had lost hope in himself and in nature. Wells sank deeper and many went dry. Even the divining rod was used in man's frantic search for water. Nature herself rebelled, covering her wounds with weeds and grasses. A hot sun beat down unmercifully on dry cracks in the earth, which once were brimming marshes. And the wind blew clouds of dust off alkali flats. The prairie pond was dead now, thanks to man.
When the deep snows of winter finally melted and heavy rains came, his rivers rose and overflowed their banks. Valuable topsoil raced downstream to be lost forever. Whole cities were flooded and people built dikes or fled their homes as floodwaters climbed. Who could believe that the clearing of a wooded slope and draining of a marsh would someday cause a mighty flood? In man's unbalanced use of land and water, in his eagerness to exploit the soil, he had forgotten the rhythm of water. Water rising upward as vapor to form clouds, falling as rain, sleet, or snow to leave its priceless load of groundwater, so essential to life on Earth. Heavy runoff must be slowed, for the more slowly water travels, the more good it does along the way. Sometimes just a log or a few big stones in a stream will slow water to an easy pace. When flash floods occur, washouts are common. Experts claim that every day as a result of erosion, we are losing the equivalent of 200 40-acre farms. When water is wisely used, it becomes man's powerful servant and his obedient slave. In the pothole country of Saskatchewan, nature's own basins collect and hold snow water, playing host to ducks flying north to Ness. Beavers build dams because they fear of losing their water supply. Ducks Unlimited engineers are eager beavers too. They design and build dams and structures to restore marsh areas and maintain safe water levels throughout the breeding season. In Alberta, some Ducks Unlimited projects are fed through ditches with surplus irrigation water. Typical of earth-filled dams is the one on the Memphis Sutton project in Saskatchewan. These men live in Ducks Unlimited trailers out on the job. Such dams create marshes whose shallows hold many broods. Uh oh, there's that photographer again. Hey, let's get out of here. Wait for me, fellas.
The Maytag Noble and Maytag Roncott projects in southern Saskatchewan are fine examples of Ducks Unlimited handiwork. Here, a concrete spillway is part of the earth-filled dam. Another popular type of dam, which Ducks Unlimited marshes are sporting these days, is the concrete structure with stop logs to control water levels, like the Contra Costa project, or the Antelope Lake Monterey project, also in Alberta. The airplane has long been employed by DU for surveying marshes, but to speed travel over waters often too shallow to float a canoe, Ducks Unlimited uses the airboat. This unique craft has proved extremely useful when making routine inspections, checking on botulism outbreaks, taking brood counts, and estimating lake populations of flightless ducks like these. The Vermilion Lakes Dam in northern Alberta was built through the cooperative efforts of the provincial government and Ducks Unlimited. This duck factory claims over 50 shoreline miles of beautiful marshes. One of the largest projects in the north undertaken jointly by the Alberta government and Ducks Unlimited, the Heart River Project not only provides water for the people in the area, but excellent breeding grounds for waterfowl. Fortunately, ducks don't seem to give a, well, a DU dam what kind of structure is built, so long as it holds ample water to carry the waterfowl family through a safe breeding season. This is one of the many duck producing basins in the famous Ding Darling project. Note the teeming insect life which abounds in the better duck marshes. Somehow the ducks seem to like it here. On Ducks Unlimited donor projects and those commemorating outstanding conservationists, a fitting cairn is erected. Such a marsh has economic value too, providing a haven for wild birds and animals community income from trapping, water for livestock. Its aesthetic value is priceless. On DU's Louisiana Lakes project in southern Alberta, large-scale banding is carried on by organized drives in which large concentrations of flightless ducks are rounded up and herded into temporary enclosures. Approximately 60,000 waterfowl have been banded by Ducks Unlimited in the last decade. All types of waterfowl have been banded from the gray goose to the diminutive green wing teal. Like the sprig or pintail, this bald pate being banded is a favorite of the Pacific Coast hunter. Released, he may turn up in some California marsh. Banding of ducks and geese reveals important information on their migration from Canada. 
helping to assure tomorrow's sportsmen that the flying bees of waterfowl will never be erased from our skies. Down through the years, Ducks Unlimited has been helping Mother Nature put more ducks on the wing. We cannot relax. We must remember that water is one of our greatest natural resources. We must not waste it. Our very existence, the future of duck hunting in North America, depends upon water conservation. Ducks Unlimited will continue to build more dams, to hold more water, to attract more ducks. But only through the help of nature and the cooperation of every sportsman can we assure the conservation of water, always remembering that water is life.